Uh, welcome to this Access Denied talk. It's going to be talk about authorization rails. And it's going to be a little bit theoretical in the first part and much more practical in the second part. So if you consider the first part boring, please wait till the end. <laughs> uh, a few notes about myself. Uh, oh, wrong button, sorry. Oh, OK. Hi, my name is Vladimir. Um, you can call me for short Vlad because it's much more simpler. Or even Pelkan, is, if you prefer to call people by their GitHub handles. Uh, I came from Moscow, from New York City, and have a long drive yesterday to Pittsburgh and brought some snow with me. Sorry for that. Um, I'm working for a company called Evil Martians. Well, a few words about Evil Martians. Uh, we do in a lot of Product development for large corporates, small startups, both sides of the ocean, any ocean, actually. Um, and we do a lot of open source development. There's a few of our most popular um, tools for front end development, back end development. Feel free to ask me about some of them. And uh, of course, we're writing about everything about this uh, now, blog with beautiful illustrations. I guess. Most of you saw at least something from that. Uh, the Rails 5.2 post was pretty popular. And um, uh, recently has landed to Pittsburgh. Oh, Pittsburgh. <laughs> it's me only. Most of our team is in Brooklyn. If you got any questions relating to product development, open source, conferences, blog posting, feel free to contact us or me at the conference. Enough uh, advertisement. Uh, let's talk about the talk itself. And the first part, as I promised, is going to be theory part. And we're talking about some namings, because it's hard. And let's start with the definition. Well, this is talk about authorization, right? So what is it? According to Cambridge Dictionary, it's a pretty authoritative uh, source of knowledge, uh, it's an act of giving someone an official permission to do something. So there are two main things. We got someone, and we make him to do something, or not make him. Uh, the problem is, the first problem of authorization is that it's pretty often confused with other type of uh, agents. And the first one is authentication. Uh, raise your hand if you don't know what's the difference between uh, authentication and authorization. Are you sure that everyone knows? OK, let's try to check. Uh, it's easy to, uh, no, uh, to figure out whether it is uh, people, person talking about authorization or authentication, because uh, there are some uh, properties of both. First, let's talk about questions. Authentication answers the question, uh, who are you? Is it really you? There are actually two questions. I combined two notions here, but to not make it even more complex, because it's identification and authentication. But these two mostly uh, often happen simultaneously, so do not distinguish them for now. So that's a simple question. And the authorization answers the, another question. Am I allowed to do that? So. That's when we're talking about authorizations, that we're talking about kind of permissions and something like that. Uh, from the code's perspective, uh, in our Rails application, we are Rails code, so let's talk about Rails. Uh, authentication happens like this. We initialize a context of our, for example, request execution. Usually it's current user in 90% of all applications. And authorizations is happens uh, when we operate on this uh, context in checking some kind of properties, explicitly or not. Uh, from the Ruby gems perspective, uh, there are not so many gems for authentications. Of course, everyone knows at least a few of them, and it's much more for authorization. And I don't know why. It's so, I guess most of you know this too. Can can or can 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 or maybe can 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 can. I don't know if it exists or not. And found it. We're mostly going to talk about them a little bit later. Uh, there are many others. Uh, that's information from a Ruby toolbox, so that's an official list of tools for authorizations. Um, just want to remind you that, uh, so the typical uh, stack of a full problem, hey, what do you use for authorization? I'm using device, what's wrong with it? So it's, OK, I guess everyone in this uh, room now knows what's the difference and never answer like this. Uh, there are another type of things that 
could be also confused with authorization, actually. It's not authorization. I call it system constraints. It's a little bit tricky. Let me show you an example. Oh, this is just uh, read the code. It's pretty obvious. Uh, what is system constraint? It's something, it's kind of environmental condition. It doesn't relate to a particular subject, particular user, and to particular resource. So it's something out of that. And it usually deals with uh, accounts limit and SaaS applications and uh, some kind of subscriptions or whatever. So it differs uh, in type of response code even what, that you show to your user, to your client. Um, that's not authorization. It's something that goes after authorization. So you're still allowed to do this kind of thing, but there are some restrictions that doesn't depend on you. And of course, there's data model constraints, so we call them validations, so it's pretty obvious. So just to sum up, we've got a four lines of defense in applications. Not every application has this all four, but that's a typical you know, diagram of trying to get to the data. Um, authorization itself consists of two parts. Uh, the first one is an authorization model. That's how we grant and revoke access. That's our model from the business logic point of view. So that's where roles, leaves, permissions, I don't know what other abstractions you use to describe uh, kind of abilities. And the next part is, I call it authorization layer. It's how to check these abilities, how to integrate this model with uh, your entry point to your data. Typically, again, it's uh, in Rails applications controllers. Uh, but we're going to talk about other users, to, other use cases too. Um, a few words about models and some the most boring part of the talk, but I don't want to get rid of it because it's, it brings a lot of information. So uh, in computer science, there are some uh, popular models to um, build access control business logic in, in your application. They all look pretty similar. There are only a few uh, first letters differs. Let's quickly uh, watch what they are. Uh, the first one, or kind of oldest one, is called discretionary access control. It's pretty simple. We got users, we got resources. And if we want to grant access, we just create an intermediate model, okay, so call it permission. So it's just a record in the database which describes uh, which activity this user is allowed to do with this uh, resource. And uh, authorization itself, the act of authorization, which I call this user can read resource, and so it's an artificial kind of DSL. It's pretty simple, we're just checking uh, the database whether the record exists. If it exists, okay, we're allowed to do that. If it's not, we not, do not allow to do that. The problem with this approach is uh, only this kind of uh, authorization logic uh, is prone to a database explosion. If you get a lot of records, a lot of users, a lot of uh, relationship between them. You had to care about all these permission records, how to clean them up. So that's a pretty complex. And that's why people try to invent other models. Uh, mandatory model is kind of the same time uh, born as a discretionary model, but it works differently. It, it uh, assumes that you get security levels for your resources, some kind of top secret, not secret at all. Or whatever, and every user has a security clearance, which is uh, from the same set of, as the security level. So all you need to is to check that uh, clearance is greater or equal to level. So if it if it is, then the action is allowed. If it's not, then it is not allowed. It's pr pretty simple, but uh, you do not have an ability uh, to, you know, to combine all these clearances in multiple dimensions. So you got one dimension of your uh, authorization models. So for most applications, it's not an option, too. Then, uh, row based models. Uh, it's a pretty popular uh, abbreviation or bug. Uh, it operates, it's kind of evolution of discretionary model, but uh, it describes, it adds intermediate abstraction row, which just collects all the set of permissions. So we got resource, we got action, and uh, some kind of level, maybe. But the problem with this one, again, is that it doesn't operate on, exact, on single resources. You either access, have access to all resources of the type or none. That's a problem. And that's why the final model, attribute-based model, appeared. It's a 
it's kind of top level of our model's evolution. Uh, I intentionally put JSON script here because uh, most of the frameworks, not in, only in Ruby, but mostly actually in enterprise like languages like Java and .NET, operates on configurations, right? They do like configuration files. And do they write their access control policies like this. Uh, usually, we do this with Ruby, for example, with CanCan. It's an example of attribute-based authorization. But uh, the idea here is that we got the resource got some property, the context, say user gets some property, and we can compare them and write it as just a plain text, almost. And uh, if you're a big fan of standards, uh, there is a project but uh, National Institute of Standards of Standardization, I don't remember, which is, describes, the, the, well, they wrote a big book writing about action-based success control. They invented uh, XML-based language to describe this control policies, and they think that that's the future. Uh, I'm not sure about it, but if you're working on something uh, maybe governmental, they initially that was born in the medical institutions for track access to uh, patient records, and they build this framework. And now they want to <coughs> spread it uh, beyond this kind of usage. So take a look at if you're looking for something uh, good. <laughs> I don't know. Um, just a second. <clears throat> so, uh, enough theory. Uh, this talk is about the second part of Australia. Of Australia. <coughs> Sorry. Authorization. Uh, it's about uh, how to verify access, how to integrate this business logic. We do not want to talk much about how to implement roles, how to uh, you know, users' permissions and whatever, how to verify the access. And there going to be more code. And that's part of the talk. First, uh, a beautiful diagram. Uh, I call it a uh, place of authorization in Rails. Uh, that's an authentication, just to remind you that it's a different part of our defense line. Uh, so we use authorization actually for two things, you, mostly. So to protect our resources, our business logic, and as a side effect, uh, when talking about Rails and web frameworks, we also use the same authorization layer to modify the output. That's uh, kind of, mm, for example, you've got some kind of additional checks on your view templates. So if users are allowed to destroy the resource, you add a delete link. If not, you do not. Actually, you use the same logic as to protect the data. So it's kind of another place where we use authorization. We also should use authorization channels. I don't know whether you use an action cable. Anyone? Oh. Uh, now I know why my talk on action cable and other cables were not accepted. No one is interested in it. <laughs> OK. So we also do authorizations there. Should do. I, I don't think anyone doing that, actually, because existing frameworks doesn't provide out-of-the-box support for action cable. Um, and also, as a previous speaker told about the GraphQL. I, I, sorry, I, I missed the talk, but I, I'm not sure whether he, he was talking about authorization or not. But we should authorize our GraphQL actions to imitators, so queries. So there is no good solution yet, too, but that's a place where we should do that, just to remind. OK, let's talk about these two tools. Mm, and the first uh, little bit of survey here. Uh, raise your hands if you're using CanCan as your first of the Oh, almost a half. Great. So that's actually a um, typical situation. Uh, I conducted a survey a month ago, not so many answers, a couple of hundreds, but uh, the situation is that uh, half of people using CanCan, another half using uh, Pandit. That's a typical uh, pros people answered. So why they chose CanCan and why they chose Pandit. And uh, speaking about CanCan, the most reasonable, it's so simple, readable config, a lot of documentation, community, easy to use. And also, oh, it was the only framework I knew. That's why I chose it. OK, that's the reason. Why not? Um, for those who are not familiar with CanCan, uh, it's kind of configuration-based, actually, a framework. Uh, we describe everything in our one file, and we use an uh, authorized helper in our controllers. 
Uh, it looks pretty simple. It's uh, readable, yeah, we know what's going on in our application. When we deal with a couple of models, maybe two, maybe three. Um, when we deal with a real life application which you know, supports some kind of business, an ability class looks like this. Uh, it's unreadable, it's actually, it's a real class that from the project I've been working on, and my task, my first task was to get rid of CanCan. -can. <laughs> That's why, <laughs> because even I didn't understand what's going on here, and no one did understand. So I don't think that ability or be should be called ability anymore. And so that's why I'm not going to talk about CanCan a lot in this talk, uh, mostly about Pounded and similar approaches. So what's a Pounded? It's just a plain old Ruby file for your policies. So for every resource, you define uh, a class uh, with methods which uh, just your usually controller actions uh, in a predicate form. And they respond actually as predicates to true, uh, returns re uh, true or false. And that's it, so it's, it's pretty simple. It's deadly simple, and then simplicity, uh, well, brings its own uh, disadvantages. Uh, the main disadvantage of Pandit, it's prone to be, in, to contain a lot of duplication in your policies. It doesn't have some feature support, for example, the most missing feature is the namespaces support. If you get namespaces in your application, for example, API, a main application, whatever, you cannot simply use different policies for them. You have to hack this uh, policy resolvers from Pandit. That's not a good idea. And actually, policy resolvers, as everything Pandit is, uh, everything else you write by yourself. So that's why usually people either hack Pandit or either try to invent their own wheel. And uh, so I already talked about the common, common evolution. It's many projects I've been working on and our team been working, been working on. Uh, so CanCan -can is good for start when you don't know what's going to be tomorrow. But uh, in one day you realize it's okay. I don't know understand what's going on. I don't want to support it. I, it's impossible. And m it's what you, what you, what's more worse, uh, uh, sometimes having such kind of magic in controllers, mostly from CanCan, -can, some kind of load and authorized resource, uh, it's really easy to got some kind of false positives, false positive authorization, which when authorization doesn't happen, actually. Uh, so many people migrate to Pandit, and they feel a little bit happier, but they try to enhance it because it doesn't solve all the needs. It's too simple to be a full feature framework to work for everyone. And um, why we need to customize this? There are a few uh, kind of uh, problems uh, which we're trying to solve by customizing this simple solution. We want to reduce the boilerplate, so it's the main uh, one of the kind of, that makes us happy as a developers, right, to write less code, to reuse code. We do want it, we write in Ruby and not you know, Go, where the dupli duplication is okay. We just don't have generics. Um, we want performance because when your rules, and it's a typical situation, deals with database queries. So you ask a database for whether there is a record which gives access to perform this method on this resource. You call database and sometimes these queries could be complex and not as fast as it could, should be. And we want to test our authorization because we need to test it a little bit more about it later. We want to make it to be flexible. So like I previously mentioned in the keynote, uh, Lego blocks. We want to build our own from some kind of existing blocks, our own solution. So uh, that all leads us to uh, thought that we need to build something new. Actually, I need to build something new. That's what I was thinking about because having doing the same customizations from for every project about three, four times, I decided well, it's time to extract all these features and wrap him in a new jam. Um, when I was accepted to the RailsConf, I was thought, oh, why there is no authorization solution in Rails out of the box? We've got a lot of uh, built-in tools. Even Action Cable, we no, no one use it. But we don't have uh, anything for authorization, which is it's actually much more popular, I think, than WebSockets. Uh, thinking about this question, well, the answer is, uh, 
Well, maybe we will uh, when it will be extracted from the base camp, but it hasn't been yet, so let's wait. But uh, trying to think about this question, I, I end up with a good title for a new gem, and I call it Action Policy, because we are in Rails, so action, or active as a first part of the framework, and then a meaning. So Action Policy, introducing a new gem, and I want to do all the rest of the talk. Oh, we got a lot of time. Okay, <sighs> to this. Um, so, in short, so it's based on pundit in terms of conception. So we use the same policy objects. We do not use pundit's code because that's the main thing which is, doesn't work in pundit. We rewrite all the inter internals. And it's born in production because, so as I already told, it's an extraction kind of gem. And it has been released today. Actually, pre-release, I haven't finished everything to be wrapped into a gem. So that's a special pre-release for RailsConf. Uh, let's take a look how it looks like, right? Oh, well, in your controllers, there is pretty sim similar to other frameworks. You just could have this authorize with exclamation mark uh, because it's raising errors, so that's why the exclamation mark uh, method with a couple more additional options you made to pass. Uh, and uh, another method called allow to, which is a predicate method, non-raising. You can use it in your views, you can anywhere else. And let's talk about Bowler right now. Uh, that's the first problem we want to solve with action policy, to reduce the duplication, to make our rules more clear, more readable. That's an example, yeah, it's a pretty simple example from Pandit. The typical situation, we got an admin or super admin and some other powerful creature in your application, which allowed to do pretty anything, right? Uh, and in your, when using Pora uh, objects for policies, you have to add this check in front of each admin or manager or whatever, admin or assigned admin or manager or owner, and so on and so forth. And this makes the logic for this exact resource less clear because, well, what's about this resource, what's about the common logic as admin, it's not readable, it's, it doesn't look great. Uh, what's different with action policy? Okay, we got a notion of pre-check. That's kind of, you uh, know, before action, before reply. It's not built on top of active support notifications, not. It's, it has its own me mechanism, but it looks like this. So it's a way to help the execution of the rule faster. So you don't need to call the rule itself, for example, if a user or admin just allow everything to it. The same way you can deny for some reason so for every action. So just adding this to every policy, we can end up with this. It's much less code, and uh, now the logic is more clear. And if you want to check for kind of admin ability, you can even skip it, okay? The interface is pretty similar to every, every Rails callbacks. So you can skip, you can specify modifiers, only accept whatever. And that's the way you can reduce the number, amount of code you write and extract the common logic from concrete policies. Um, another simple example, let's go through to this slide. It's just a small, small addition to what we usually have. Uh, we use a convention over configuration to not specify policies every time explicitly in your controllers because, well, we in Rails, why not? We already know that we are in products controllers and we use product policy. That's uh, responded, it looked like this. Uh, it's, I, I don't know, it's not readable as a human language. It's not really like style. And uh, the final few slides, uh, that's an inspiration actually from CanCan. That's the last time I'm gonna, I guess, uh, mention this framework. And the ability to add the default rule. Instead of uh, defining every rule uh, for every action, because usually we extract authorization into kind of before action callback, load resource, and then authorize. And instead of adding every uh, a, a rule to a policy file or adding an alias, we can just mark some rule as a default one. And when the rule is not explicitly set, we just call it. It's a dangerous kind of thing, actually, because there could be a typo, and then the default rule is applied. So I'm not sure it's good and bad, but I'm using it. 
uh, if you're afraid of these typos, you can specify uh, aliases like this. It differs from Ruby aliases, but I'm not going to go too deep to explain, actually, maybe in the end of the talk where we can find why we need this kind of aliases, but specific, not Ruby-based. Okay, let's talk about performance. Oh, that's a problem. First of all, what we want to measure when dealing with authorization? Uh, what are we looking for? Um, when we use authorization in our controllers, uh, every action usually, for every action we call this authorized method. And it calls this policy and so on and so forth. Uh, it already told some uh, rules um, imply calling database inside, so it could be uh, performance heavy. Not so often, but one call won't break everything. Uh, but what if there is more than one call, if we use it in our views, for example? Uh, I started with the implementation of measurement tools, and uh, we re use in Rails, so let's try Active Support Notifications Framework and add our own events to uh, authorization calls. There are two kinds of events, uh, one just for authorized call and one for every rule that is applied, so every policy call. And I've tried to uh, play with it, uh, add it to our application, and I found this. Wow, we didn't expect it. It turned out that uh, for some uh, pages, some controller actions, we made in oh, well, so 45 policy checks, 45 calls to policy something, check something. Why does this happen? Well, it's a pretty common situation when you render in a list of resources and you check, oh, whether I want to show this edit link or destroy link, and I'm calling a policy to check, am I allowed to do it, add it to this res resource? I'm not. So we end up with this situation, I call it N plus one authorization, obviously. And in some cases, when we, again, <laughs> dealing with database, it transforms to N plus one query, and that's a better situation. We want to avoid it. And to avoid it, uh, we build a complex system of caching. <laughs> well, it's two levels and um, multiple layers in each. Actually, it's an inter internal thing. You shouldn't care about it when you use an action policy. It's built the way you can enable and disable any layer and don't use it and don't think about it. The idea is to reuse policy object as much as possible and uh, to avoid calling the same rule twice during the execution context. Uh, even between multiple processes, we use a cache store. Oh, so it's pretty good uh, Rails interface. Just uh, set up cache store to, for example, brand new Redis cache store for Rails 5.2, and mark uh, your, does it work? No, it doesn't work. And mark your method uh, with cache, uh, that's it. And we store this, the result of the execution of this slow, uh, heavy rule in so Redis, and we use it between uh, process between requests and we can uh, then draw some kind of beautiful pictures to measure the impact of the cache. So uh, many diagrams, uh, the, the top two, it's a hit miss rate. So we can see that in our application mostly hit rate, so we're using data from cache. We do not uh, execute rules too often, and um, the lower gra uh, graphics show uh, the amount of time spent for cached and uncached rule. So the left one shows policy rules, so our calls to authorize, and the, the right one, top bottom bottom right, shows, uh, we don't have this, okay, uh, policy scopes cache, we do, do cache scopes too, and uh, for scopes, uh, Impact is great. We, we save hundreds of milliseconds per request. And for policy, it's actually great too, even that one check is only self thousands of milliseconds. When you have dozens of calls to policy in a request, you got again hundreds. So first of all, try to measure, then try to add cache, and that's it. Let's talk about tests. That's my favorite topic, actually. Uh, I hope I have enough water for the rest of the talk. So, 
when we're talking about testing and authorization, first thing we should care about is a coverage. But don't worry. Hey, yeah. 100% coverage. But I'm not talking about code coverage. No, it's a kind of useless thing. Uh, I'm talking about business logic coverage. You should be, uh, you must be sure that your tests cover all your edge cases related to authorization because, well, if you miss something, then a bad guy can access your data or spoil it or whatever. So every entry point where you use authorization should be covered 100%. And it's uh, not easy because where do you test authorization? Uh, I asked this question and got the following results. Uh, most people te test uh, test authorization logic in their requests, controllers, uh, and unit tests. Well, when you test authorization in request and controller, you have to provide a whole context. And for every edge case of, in your rule, you have to make request. Yeah, oh, thank you. Uh, great. <laughs> and. Uh, in our situation, in our application, that's a controller, controller's test. Uh, I don't have a number here, though. There are about uh, 3,000 of tests uh, at all. And almost half of them was just to test uh, the access control. Not the logic of controller itself, actually, but the, the way we uh, give access to users. If we're going to talk about time, so it's four minutes out of nine. It's really, <laughs> really slow. And uh, how can we solve this problem? Actually, we do not have to test everything in our functional layer, in our controllers. Uh, but we have to be sure that their exact policy is called, and only it is. So uh, with action policy, we got a simple helper for RSpec and Minitest too. But I prefer RSpec, so the examples in RSpec. Uh, what is what is doing? Uh, the first thing I want to note is that um, action policy built with testability in mind. So it was a first design solution. Uh, and uh, to make it testable, uh, it has a test mode in which it tracks every call to authorize method during you know, the, the test, for example. Like, I don't know, like WebMock or VCR works in, for HTTP requests. And then you can check with this uh, RSpec or Minitest matcher, that the exact policy has been called. And if it hasn't been called, we can show you a pretty beautiful message showing which policies were used during this request. Thus, we need only one test per action to verify our access control. That's it. So we can reduce the amount of testing drastically in our controllers. And as for policy itself, well, we can test it as a simple Ruby object. There is no magic. You can just call this uh, show method, for example, and assert that it's true for this kind of setup. That's it. So uh, your test becomes faster and, uh, well, actually easily to maintain. Well, more features. That's the uh, end of the talk, but not a quick end. I mentioned that we use scopes, but uh, currently it's under web on GitHub. I'm working on it. Um, I got a kind of active record like uh, interface, not like Pandit with its classes for scopes. Sorry. Uh, so the main idea here, except from default scope, which modifies uh, the relation collection, is a name scope because in some cases you might be want to use something else, some other kind of uh, filtration of your collection. And uh, so the usage is pretty simple. Just call it on a collection and that's it. And you can reuse everything you write in your policy so scopes live within policy instance. So uh, you have all the helpers, all the context, user record, whatever. Um, the, the, the big question with scopes, uh, I, I showed a couple of diagrams, uh, charts, uh, where I show that we cache scopes and it's cre pretty cool. But I, as for now, I'm not sure how to make it available to everyone because we use our own lo logic to cache scopes. And it's a little bit tricky to make it uh, you know, more general for everyone to use. So we give an act active record relation. 
cache somehow, oh, sorry, uh, cache it somehow, and uh, well, it works as magic. Currently, I'm working on it. If you got some ideas, please share. Um, time spaces. Uh, I mentioned it as one of uh, disadvantage of funded, and it's a great example. So, uh, in action policy, there is automatical uh, inferral of uh, policies for resources when you work working within a namespace. So, if you work in an admin namespace, we try to find first an admin product policy, for example, like this, and only then fall back to product policy, global policy, kind of. And you can also manually specify the namespace, dynamic namespace is also available. So the namespace is set through all the execution context and yeah, we'll be talking about controls. Uh, also, we got some tools to integrate with internationalization. Or, uh, just show an example. Uh, so, uh, Action policy raises a specific kind of uh, exception when authorization fails. You can rescue from it to provide some kind of feedback to a user. And uh, the message here will be something specified in your locale for this kind of uh, rule, rule that fails. And you, that's way you can easily, using your common locales, provide more specific uh, messages to users than you are not allowed to perform this action. Well, okay, what should I do then? I don't know. Uh, more about this in the next feature uh, called failure reasons. So it's an ability to track which checks fails during the rule application. So in that example, we wrap our checks into allowed to, which is the same as in controller, so we can use it, for example, to use another policy within this one, so kind of delegation. And uh, when an exception happens, we got a special reason subject, which contains keys for failed uh, policies. So let's come back to the example. The show uh, rule failed in two cases, when you're not allowed to view applicants in that case, and you're not allowed to show stage, you don't have access to stage, whatever it is. So if first one fails, we got a first, uh, no, actually second, kind of reasons messages, applicant view. So we failed due to not, you do not have enough permissions to view applicants. If the second one fails, we got the first one case. You do not have access to the stage. And that way we can specify a custom message, even add a call to action for a user. You do not have to stage. Maybe you want to call a manager to add you to the stage. Or you don't have access uh, permission to manage users. Maybe you want to ask a manager to add this permission for you. Something like that. And of course, uh, you can even put it into your locales again. And uh, uh, as with active model errors object, we get full messages to provide uh, translation of these uh, keys. Oh, more features. Uh, I've been talking mostly about controllers and a little bit about channels, but action policy built that way that you can actually add this kind of authorized code and allow to to anywhere you want. Uh, just a quick example, pretty artificial. We got a model called action policy behavior, just included into your class and uh, add some kind of configuration. So you have to specify your authorization of. Authorization context, so authorization sub subject performer, uh, so in the case user, and you can just call authorize and everything else works, like in your controller. So if you're using, maybe you're not using Rails, so for example, Hanami, you can use uh, action policy with it, so it's not actually not Rails specific framework. It's built to be not Rails specific and dependency less. Well, um, I started to talk about authorization context. Actually, I forgot to add it to slides, so just was finishing five minutes before the talk, so. But that's a key feature, actually. So, uh, one of the common disadvantage of authorization uh, frameworks is that uh, they think that you always have current user, et cetera. That's all you want to authorize, that's your authorization context. But, uh, well, usually it's not. You got some kind of other context. For example, if you're building a multi tenancy application, you got a tenant, so called account. And you can use it in your rules too. 
So uh, with action policy, you can specify any number of these contexts. You have to do that in two places. In your policy, uh, to make policy works, expect this uh, context uh, during the in initialization. And in your, say, controller, or where, you, where is your behavior lives, I don't know. At time is over, I'm always over too. So that's uh, the way you can provide more context without, you know, creating artificial structures to wrap your current user with something else. Just tell the action policy that you want to add more context, more environment to your rule checks, and that's it. Well, useful links. So we got a GitHub. We got a pretty cool documentation. A lot of things out there uh, are not mentioned in the talk because I got only 45 minutes. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you.